and, uh, and welcome to the Virtual Jug. This is uh, episode, or session 56 rather, should I say, and, uh, and joining us today is uh, Henry Coles. Henry, how are you doing? Fine, thanks. And whereabouts are you calling in from today? Uh, Edinburgh. Edinburgh, awesome. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful city, actually. I've only been maybe once or twice for like a day or two, but I love I love Edinburgh, awesome. How long have you been in Edinburgh for? Yeah, 15, 16 years now. Okay, beautiful. Um, so today we're going to be talking about mutation testing, right? That's right, yes. And uh, what's your affiliation with mutation testing? Uh, well, I guess about sort of five years ago I created a mutation testing firm for Java, which has been quite successful. Um, so that's just a thing I find interesting. Awesome, cool. And uh, also joining us is Oleg. Oleg, how are you doing? Pretty good. Hi, guys. Awesome. Really? And... Uh, and what's happening on Rebel Labs? Something, something quite interesting happened today, right? Yeah, exactly. So just just a couple of hours ago, we released uh, a cheat sheet uh, for Java 8 best practices, featuring some advice on how to use default methods, uh, lambdas, and the uh, optionals uh, for the best to keep your code uh, clean, readable, and maintainable. So check it out. I will post the link uh, to the RC chat. Hopefully you will enjoy that, you will share that, or you will print it out and slip under the coffee mug of the less experienced colleague. Awesome. So before we, uh, we're about to get underway, uh, just to show you uh, a few slides before we start. So this session is mutating testing with PyTest, and uh, our speaker today is Henry Coles at, and that's a zero, HJC, that's right, yeah, Henry? That's right, yeah, I picked a right, really awesome. good uh, Twitter handle. <laughs> um, and the Virtual Jug uh, is sponsored by Zero Turnaround and a media partner, Rebel Labs, where we do write-ups of all our sessions. So for the write-up of Henry's session, plus all the links and also an interview with Henry, which Oleg will be doing, do go to Rebel Labs to check that out. Um, proud sponsors of the Virtual Jug is Zero Turnaround. Uh, we do a couple of uh, some great developer tools, one called JRebel, which allows you to instantly reload your code changes, and, of course, XRebel, the lightweight Java profiler, which allows you to find production-style performance issues while you're developing your code. So do check them out. There's a couple of 14-day trials for each of them. Um, for this session, you can join on IRC to engage with us. Um, if you go to a Freenode server and join, join the channel Pound Virtual <coughs> Jug, you can discuss with others and ask your questions there. Please do share the group and session among your friends. Uh, we're almost at 5,000. We're only 100 and something uh, away from 5,000, which is a, a really great achievement only in our second full year. Uh, so please do share that. And of course, if you have feedback about the session or the group in general, uh, you can ping me on either Virtual Jug, uh, at Virtual Jug, or Twitter, uh, my personal Twitter, should I say, at SJ Maple. So feel free to, to ping me. And uh, so, without further ado, I'll hand over to uh, to Henry Coles, and uh, let me pass over the screen. Henry, would you like to uh, start sharing your screen, and we can? Uh... Okay, off we go. Can you see me now? We can see your slides. Yeah. Excellent. I shall I shall start then. So I'm here to talk about uh, mutation testing uh, with uh, PyTest, also known as uh, PIT. And this takes to us about seven seconds to describe. Um, however, I'm going to sort of pad it out now for the next 45 minutes, maybe an hour. So I'll kick off actually with some questions. Um, these are questions which get asked uh, quite commonly today, um, such as, how do I safely refactor my tests? Um, how do I know if I can trust a test suite that I inherited? Uh, how do I ensure the tests I'm writing are effective? Or indeed, how do I ensure that my team is writing effective tests? Now, actually, if you think about it, this is actually just one question that gets pressed in several different ways. And that question is, how do I assess the quality of a test suite? Or perhaps more accurately, how do I assess the strength of a test suite? Now, at this point, I usually sort of um, look to the room and ask for some answers, um, which point people sort of tend to look at their feet and shuffle a little bit and tease out of them, I generally get a few answers, uh, which tend to look on the lines of this. I'm paraphrasing ever so slightly when I do this. So, don't worry, it'll be fine. That's QA's problem. I'm a ninja rock star. I know my tests are good. Now, 
After a while, we tend to get some better answers, um, such as, I do TDD. I know my tests are good. But, well, are you sure? What about the tests you didn't write, you didn't write or didn't write yourself? And plenty of people say they do TDD, uh, but they actually are writing their tests first. And how do you drive um, changes to your tests? Do you write tests for your tests? Do you write tests for the tests for your tests? I'm kind of hoping the answer is, is no. Now, my earphones have gone completely silent. Is everyone still with me? We are with you. Silent. Is everyone still with me? We are with you, yeah. That's good to know. <laughs> uh, it's one of those weird presentations, isn't it, where uh, the only person maybe looking at you might be a cat, if you're lucky. We have no office cat at the moment. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> so another quite good answer is uh, peer review. Now, this is also is good, but has a few drawbacks. Um, it's inconsistent. So it depends on who does the review, um, when the review happens, how long you've waited, how much code, have they had coffee, if you've been drinking, all sorts of different factors, you'll get very different results. You'll catch things sometimes, sometimes not. So it's inconsistent. And it's also labor intensive. Um, it takes you know, two people some of their time to sit and do a peer review. And perhaps most women, it's actually quite a slow form of feedback. So most peer reviews happen hours or probably days after the code is written. So if it's a problem, you don't find out about it for quite some time. And then usually someone mentions code coverage. And when they say code coverage, they usually mean one of line, branch, or statement. But in fact, there's a whole slew of other types which people are less aware of. Um, things like data coverage, path coverage, modified condition decision, there's lots and lots of others, which I'll talk about at great length if I knew anything about them. The only thing I do know about them is that all these COVID me measures, including the really exotic ones, um, tell you absolutely nothing about which bits of your code have actually been tested. Now, oh, I just spilled water over my computer. Excellent. It hasn't fused yet, before it'll be fine. So, think about what's actually been tested. They do tell you something, they're not useless. So if you have code coverage, I have a nice class here, and we know for certain that this line here has been executed. This line's been executed by a test, and this line here has not been executed by any tests. But that's all it tells us. Because unfortunately, executing code and testing code is not the same thing. You need to execute code to test it, but just because you executed it does not mean you've, you've tested it. So what do I mean by that? Well. I guess this is sort of a classic example. We have a test here which will generate 100% um, branch coverage for the, the class we saw before, but it's not a meaningful test. It contains no assertions. So for this test to fail, but the only way it could fail would be if the class itself threw a runtime exception. I think the name of the test gives us a bit of a clue as to maybe you know, how this test came into being. It looks like someone's probably set a code coverage target for a team. The team's not particularly invested in the idea. They don't see any value, so they're trying to gain the system. This is what I call a bad faith test. It's been written really, to try and gain a metric. It's not been written to try and actually write a useful, meaningful test. Now, you do see these sort of tests occasionally, but they're quite rare. Uh, more common, and what mutation testing is really all about, are good faith tests. So a good faith test, just to give an example, which would give 100% branch coverage but not be a complete test, would be something like this. So we have this um, lovely method here, foo, which takes a boolean and returns a string. And someone sat down diligently and they've created a couple of tests. They check if it returns OK when it's true, they check if it returns fail when it's false. Um, but they don't check what is probably the most important part of the function, which is this side effect here, this vitally important business function. So it's not the sort of test you'd like to write if you're test driving code, but if you're te doing tests last, it could certainly happen. So you've created all the coverage, but you've not properly actually tested the code. You haven't tested the behavior. So code coverage is really just telling you what's not been tested. Um, when you have lines that aren't covered, um, which are expected to be covered, it tells you you've made a mistake. This is, this is still useful. Um, knowing you've made a mistake is hand information, but it's not, not the whole story. Um, if you start to think that I've got line coverage or branch coverage, and therefore my code is tested, that isn't the case. So let's see if we can fix that uh, bad faith test. So all I've done here is I've just taken that original test, I've split it into three methods, and I've added some assertions. 
So we now check that um, we start off with a count of zero. But if we add a number above 10, we get um, an incremented count up to it. And if we add a number below 10, we don't increment the count. So Simon, tell me, do you think I've now properly tested um, that original class? So let's see. Um... I would say yes, but I, I'm going to guess the answer is no. <laughs> Culling and, and correct. Um, so our peer review there came up with the answer that we have a problem here, but no one knows what the problem is. Um, so that was a, a valuable peer review, but no action we can take from it. So modern answers really aren't, aren't that great. Um, we don't have a, a very good way of assessing the strength of our test suite. Now, fortunately for us, way back in 1971, a guy called Richard Lipton actually gave us a much better answer um, to, to all these questions. Now, Richard Lipton went on to have a glorious academic career. Um, he got the prize last year, um, did lots of interesting things, but back in 1971, he was still a student. This was a student paper. But it's a student paper that actually spawned an entire um, new area of research. So Lipton's paper had one very simple but interesting idea in it. Um, so his paper was called The Fault Diagnosis of Computer Programs. And the idea was this, which was, if you want to know if a test suite has properly checked some code, introduce a bug, but do it on purpose. Then run your test suite and see if it can find it. It's a very simple idea, but it turns out to be very powerful. So here's a bug. This is our original code from earlier. And we've introduced a small change, a little tiny bug, which was here. We've changed um, what was once a greater than or equal sign to a greater than sign. So if you run those tests um, presented before, we'll find that they still pass. And the reason they pass is because we're missing a, a test case. Um, we've failed to check what happens when we pass in exactly 10, which is what that greater than or equal than sign, the equal for part, um, gave the behavior. So a bit of terminology. That change was made, the greater than or equal to greater than is called a mutation operator. Now, lots of these are possible. You could change it to less than or equal, to greater than, to equals. You could comment out a method call. You could switch a method call to a different method call, the same signature, change zero to ones. Basically, there's pretty much an infinite list. Anything you could think of could be an operator. But all these are very small, simple changes. They're not big, sprawling changes to the code. It's just very simple, small changes to the program. Excuse me. <clears throat> so when we apply mutation operator to some code, we create a mutant. So we create a basically an alternate version of the code, um, which differs um, in perhaps in its behaviour. And we can create lots of these, so we can do it automatically. So given a, a class, we could generate thousands of mutant versions of that class, which differ in one very small, tiny way each from the original. So when we've done our test suite against this mutant version of the code, um, if it doesn't cause a test to fail, we say that mutant survived. If it does cause um, a test to fail, we say the mutant was killed. So I guess one of the big sort of take homes here, which maybe is a little bit of context, um, is that killing is good. So that's sort of all good so far, but how about this? So not the most beautiful code, but this sort of ugly guard at the top, and little if with a side effect at the bottom, which we can mutate. Yet again, we've changed our greater than equals to uh, a greater than. But we have a sort of problem here. So at this point in the code, I can never be 100. This ugly guard at the top makes sure, that, makes sure that's the case. So we have a problem, because it isn't actually possible to write a test that will kill this mutant. Any test we write which will fail um, this mutant version of the code will also fail for the original version of the code. So the mutant is logically equivalent to the original code. It does exactly the same thing, even though the program is different. So the terminology we use for this is we say the mutant is equivalent. Oh, I really hoped you were going to say it was a zombie mutant. That is a great phrase. I shall try to use it to get the community. <laughs> <laughs> so sadly, not a zombie, but equivalent. But how about this one? So this is the same again. Um, also logically equivalent to visual code, but there's less of it. And code is horrible, horrible stuff. It's where bugs live. So having less code is a good thing. So 
this equivalent mutant has done something actually quite helpful for this. What it's done is it's highlighted some redundant code. And it's done it in a very fine-grained way. It's told us that some of that sort of the, the line of statement level is actually it's useless, it's not needed, and we can delete it. So now sometimes equivalent mutants are very useful, we've just seen. But there's also a problem. And the problem is that unfortunately there's no way um, to tell um, generally whether a mutant which has survived simply lacks um, a killing test case, effective test case, or if it's equivalent. You need a human to examine the mutants, to go and have a look, have a think about it, scratch their head and decide this one's equivalent, this one lacks a test case. Which potentially could be quite um, time consuming if you have a lot of surviving mutants. Now we'll talk about this a bit later on. Uh, it's one of the things which has often been considered a problem with mutation testing. Um, but well, so we'll talk about that a little bit later. So in summary, mutation testing is highlighting code which definitely is tested. And I contrast that to just normal coverage, which is highlighting code which definitely is not tested. You can see they kind of they work together, and in fact you find having both side by side is actually a very useful thing. And it gives you a very high degree of confidence in a test suite. If you have a test suite which has a high mutation coverage, you can be pretty confident that it does a good job of confirming that code does what it does. As we've seen, it can highlight redundant code. It can sometimes even find bugs. Now, we've just introduced a lot of very small changes to the code. And you know, what if the version of the code with the small change is actually what you wanted all along? Well, if you had a bug there, you change the code and actually find the mutant version is what you wanted. So this happens sometimes. It's not the sort of primary purpose of mutation testing. It's not many for finding bugs, but it's a, a side benefit you sometimes get. And perhaps most importantly, it effectively tests your tests. Now, it's the only way I'm aware of where you can actually refactor your tests and have any confidence. Normally, if you, if you change your test, you do it without a safety net. You don't know you haven't broken something. Um, so mutation testing gives that confidence you otherwise couldn't have. Unless you were writing test your tests and test your test your tests add on infinitum. So I think it's actually a really powerful idea. Um, so the question is, what happened to it? Well, back in 1971, we had Lipton's student paper. Then just nine short years later, the first automated tool. Then into the 80s, lots of research happening. Um, mutation testing at this point is a fairly healthy discipline of research in its own right. Okay, lots of research papers. And one of the first sort of questions they asked um, part of the research was, OK, this sounds great. So this tells you if our test suite can find artificial bugs. But does that mean it can find real ones? And academics tackle this sort of with a two-pronged approach. The first thing they had was what they call the competent programmer hypothesis. Now, this basically states is that, generally speaking, programmers were competent enough to produce code that is at least almost right. Now, my share might vary somewhat. Um, but the idea is that, generally speaking, if you're fitting some code, you'll get it almost right. Maybe make a little mistake here, a little mistake there, little oopses. Now, mutation testing introduces these, if you've seen, very small changes to the code. So the mutants we generate look a lot like the bugs that this competent program might be generating. There's just one problem with this, um, which is it's clearly um, rubbish. Because while some bugs do indeed look like that, um, plenty don't. Plenty are a lot more complex. So we have a scale from these little whoopses, little tiny mistakes at one end up to we built the wrong thing, the customer wanted a tractor sales website, we built a Bitcoin exchange. Clearly, our Bitcoin exchange will look nothing like the correct program. Now, in between this, we'll have um, bugs which we have built the right thing, but the bugs are a bit more complicated. They're not the simple, tiny change to the code. Now, this is explained away with the sort of second term sort of um, pillar of mutation testing, which is called the coupling effect. Now, what this states, I'll read it out here, it says that tests that can distinguish a program different from a correct one by only simple errors can also implicitly distinguish more complex errors. So in other words, if your test suite can find uh, little tiny small bugs in your code, it can also find the more complicated ones in the same location. Now, quite a lot of research has been done into the coupling um, effect, um, and it has quite strong empirical support. 
So what a lot of the research does is it basically takes some real code bases, looks at tests, which looks at the, the bugs, and says, basically, could this test, which caught this tiny bug, have caught this more complex bug? And the answer has generally been yes. Um, this one from Offert, who's done a lot, quite a big name in research uh, mutation testing. So his major conclusion from this was it is that by explicitly testing for simple faults, we're also implicitly testing for more complicated faults. But it's important to understand this is just a probabilistic statement. So there's no sort of um, provable law that says this is the case. It just means that generally, on average, it will probably be true. So if you sit down and try to uh, construct a, a complicated bug, which isn't caught by a test which caps a simple bug, then you, you will be able to, to do that. It, it is certainly possible. But in general, if your mutants can find, um, sorry, if your tests can find mutants, they'll probably find real bugs. So on now into the 90s. Lots more research, some more academic tools. And by this point, mutation testing actually has been used to help in other sorts of research. So if you're, for example, researching generating um, tests automatically, you're probably assessing whether or not your technique works using mutation testing. If you're doing um, test suite reduction, again, you're probably using mutation testing to say, does my technique work? It's considered the gold standard of coverage techniques. So through the 90s into the noughties, and it's worth mentioning now, I think, Jester. Now, Jester's interesting. This was a mutation testing tool for Java. I don't think it was the first one. I think it was probably new Java. Um, but what interesting about Jester is it was the first non-academic tool. It was sort of open source from the community. And Kent Beck had a play with it. And had this lovely quote, which was, why do you think your tests are good when you can know for sure? Sometimes Jester tells me my tests are airtight. But sometimes the change it finds comes as a bolt from the blue. Highly recommended. So we have Kent Beck giving a pretty ringing endorsement for mutation testing and for Jester back in 2000. So what happened was nobody used it. Moving on into the rest of the noughties, lots more research, a few more tools popping up. Until we reach 2015, when something's, uh, something's changed. So now in 2015, we find actually mutation testing is in daily use all over the world and in a non-academic context. It's been used in just normal teams. It's been used in some quite high profile projects. Uh, I'll quiz you, Simon. Do you know what this is? A large Hydron Collider? No, Fantastic no. guess. That no, is the Large Hydron Collider at CERN. It turns out the um, control systems for this are written in Java and are now mutation tested uh, with PyTest. Do you know what this is, Simon? Um, it's a country, I'm guessing. Well, it's a country. Our beautiful name is Norway. No, um, okay. Yeah, I should have known that. Yeah, you should have known that. I knew that because I looked it up before the session. Uh, so Norway's um, e voting systems were also mutation tested. It's now been decommissioned, but another sort of high-profile project. So those two are sort of interests, I guess, are kind of almost sort of safety critical systems. We might expect some esoteric academic technique to get used, but mainly it's been used in what might call normal code. So that you know, I write every day. So it's used recruitment websites, tractor sales, insurance websites or insurance systems, lots in banking, biotech, media companies, lots of, you know, should we say, everyday common garden code bases. So you know, what happened? So Kent Beck gave us this ring endorsement uh, about sort of 10, 15 years ago, for mutation testing, and nobody listened. The academics have been quite excited about it for the last 40 years, but no one's been listening to them. So you know, what's, what's changed? Well, those 40 years of research suggested there were two fairly fundamental problems with mutation testing. The first were equivalent mutants, which we've talked about a little bit already, and I'm going to dig into a bit deeper um, later on. And the second was it's just too slow. It's inherently a very expensive thing to do. So to sort of see what I mean by that, let's do a quick sort of back of the envelope calculation. Oh, sorry. Which, and the reason it's um, slow is because I have to compile code for thousands of times. So for every mutant, we need to compile the code, and for every mutant, we need to run the test suite. So to sort of see what that sort of means in practice, I want to take a look at this library here, which is um, Google Truth. I think it's not particularly well known. Um, it's produced by some guys at Google. It's an assertion library um, for Java. It's a tiny project. Um, I think it's about 3,000 lines of code. It takes about three seconds to compile on my laptop about seven seconds to run the test, so it's hard to imagine a, a smaller, useful code base. 
Um, it's quite well tested. It sort of makes sense. I guess guys at Google are probably fairly competent. Um, the, it's in the realm of testing. These guys care about testing. They seem to have done a pretty good job. But it's a small code base. So say we generated about 700 mutants. That would mean we'd need to compile the code 700 times and the test 700 times. My maths is truly terrible, but I think it adds up to that. Which then adds up to about 70,000 seconds or 170 minutes or two hours. So that's two hours of processing for the smallest piece of code you can imagine. Let's try Joda time. Joda time's a bit bigger. Um, as people don't know, which I thought was nobody, it's a small library for dealing with dates and time. It's about 68,000 lines of code, about 70,000 lines of test code. It takes about 10 seconds to compile, about 16 seconds to run the unit tests. So it's a bigger code base, so we'll have more mutants. The more code you have, the more mutants you have. So say we have 10,000 mutants. That's 10,000 compile cycles, 10,000 test cycles. It's so up to 260,000 seconds. 72 hours, or about, and about three days. So probably not something you want to do before each commit. So you can kind of see why there's a problem here. Um, and we'll talk about that more a bit later. First of all, I'd like to do a live demo of PyTest. I do this using um, Google Truth. <clears throat> if you'd like to play like home, you can. Uh, this here is a fork of Truth I made a few months ago, so it's probably a little bit out of date from um, the master. The only change I've made is to make a few edits to the POM just to make it um, ready for mutation testing. <clears throat> so I can switch to my console. Ooh. Not to spoil the surprise. I'll just put that. Uh, I'll put that URL in IRC as well. So anyone wanting, the, anyone who didn't get that, just click on it in IRC. Okay. So this is a project um, built with Maven. Excuse me. <coughs> now I've added PyTest to the POM um, as a profile called PyTest. I've just enabled that with minus p, and I'm going to set it running, which our back envelope calculation suggests is probably around about two hours. So I'm going to need to talk for quite a while to fill that gap, um, which I should start doing now. <clears throat> so one of the common misconceptions about mutation testing is that it's random. Now, I feel like it could be random, but there's certainly no reason it has to be, and it certainly isn't if you're using um, PyTest. So for the same input, um, you always get the same output um, from PyTest. So it's, it's a fully repeatable process. And I'll talk about a little bit more about that Hopefully, if the um, console gives us some little clues about what to talk about, but just while we're waiting, so we've been through, we've run Surefire, and we're now running the, the PyTest um, plugin. It's another little time filler. Um, I'll mention that it's also known as PIT, um, which stood for something I forget quite what. Um, it's not important, but if you hear people talk about PIT, it's the same thing as PyTest. Now, it is running, it's going through. Uh, Truth has all sorts of annotation processing, I think a bit of um, grit in there as well, so we get a few um, warnings and things from that. So um, what's, it doing, what's it doing now, Henry? Is it, it's compiling the 60 mutation test, it, right? Um, it's not doing that, and I'll explain exactly what it's doing in a moment, because it's now finished in a little bit less than two hours. So instead of two hours, that took one minute and 11 seconds, which is actually slightly slow for this code base. Um, that's because it's a live demo. Um, so we'll talk about why it's a little bit faster in a moment. I just want to have a quick look at the output first. So as you can see, um, we generated 757 mutations, and we killed most of them. So 88% killed. It's actually pretty good for covers that's never been mutation tested. Um, so we get like a nice headline picture at the top. Um, further down, each of these here is a mutation operator, which we talked about before and we get a bit of a breakdown of what happened to um, each of those. Uh, so you have various sort of statuses, um, killed, we talked about already, and survived. Now, timed out um, is an interesting one. So I mentioned before that this is a fully sort of deterministic, repeatable process. I lied ever so slightly. There's one little bit of um, non-determinism, which is these timeouts. So one thing that could happen when you create a mutant is you might create a mutant which never, never completes. It starts an infinite loop. Say, for example, you took out the increment from a for loop, then that for loop would run forever. So PyTest has to deal with this, because it obviously wouldn't be acceptable if you'd start a build and it's simply never finished. 
So the very first thing that PyTest does is it runs all the tests against the unmutated version of the code. It checks they all pass, because that's quite important. But it also gathers some timing information. So it times how long each individual test takes. Then when it introduces a mutant and runs the same test, it, if it takes longer than um, it took in the unmutated version of the code, plus a big fudge factor, it says, OK, that's probably an infinite loop. Um, so the problem you have there is that this, this works quite well, but if other things happen box at the same time, maybe a process kicks in the background, you might find that PyTest decides, oh, this time that must be an infinite loop and times it out. So you might occasionally see that you have mutants which move between being timed out and killed or survived um, if depending on just, just how close it is to the wire. And if that happens, you can um, increase the fudge factor a bit. Uh, some different statuses here. We have non-viable. Um, this means there's a mutant which couldn't even be loaded into the JVM. And if you see one of those, it basically means I've made a program error and I've messed up. That should never happen. Uh, similarly, um, memory error, this is a little bit like the timeout. You might get a mutant which causes um, huge amounts of memory to be consumed. Uh, for example, maybe you had a loop which usually ran you know, 100 times and now runs a million times and adds to um, a hash map, and you might find that you actually have memory problems. So those are captured with this, this status here. And the rest of these are largely internal, not of interest, apart from no coverage, which we shall talk about a bit later. So this is all well and good. It gives you some nice little statistics. But this isn't actionable. This is just interesting. We now know we have 88% mutation coverage. That's great, but we can't do much with that. So for actual actionable um, information, we need to go to the um, report. Which hopefully everyone can see my screen now. Is that visible? Yeah, if you can turn it, make the uh, font size a little bit bigger. That's it. That's it. Perfect. This would look fairly familiar to most people. It's a bit like you get from um, Chicago. So we have the overall project, line coverage, and mutation coverage side by side. And then we can drill down into the packages, which we shall do now. So again, we get um, for each, each file, we get a measure of the line and mutation coverage. And if you scan these things, what's usually interesting to look for um, is where you have a discrepancy between the line and the mutation coverage. Most of these are actually fairly sort of closely mirroring each other. Um, some of them, which I now can't see, oh, such as, yeah, um, there you come. And expect. Int array oh. subject. Thank you, actually. I've clicked something earlier if I was better to see that. So, primitive int array subject would probably be interesting because we have a bit of disparity. I'm actually going to click on the float array subject just because it gives me the full um, sort of gamut of what I can demonstrate on the file. So we have the source, um, and we'll find it in various places. We'll see these nice big long um, green lines. These just show line coverage. Um, so we just know that's normal line coverage um, there. That, that line's covered. These darker green shorter boxes are where we've um, searched a mutant. So this line here, we have. If you hover over this, it's telling us it's a little bit of a, a wordy description. Basically, what it's telling us is that we've placed this return of um, float with return null. And because it's in green, we know that there's a test which um, killed that. This isn't all that surprising. That's what we call an unstable mutation operation. So placing um, a string with null, it's pretty easy to detect. If your test really use the code at all, they're probably going to null pointer, so they're probably going to fail. So it's, it's quite unstable. So going a bit further down, we get to some red bits. So big, long, sort of pinky red lines, that's where we have no line coverage. And when we have this darker sort of pink on the um, lighter pink, that's where we have a mutation which um, survived um, on an uncovered line. So hover over. So what we did here is we actually only makes it a bit bigger for people. So, Right here is we've removed um, the call to fail with raw message. So we've effectively commented out that line and no test has failed. That isn't surprising because we have no line coverage for that, for that line. And a bit further down, we have this one. So there we have a mutant which has survived on a line which was covered. So this is inherently more interesting than one above because we know that it was executed, 
but uh, this suggests it wasn't tested. And we've got a bit further down, and come to, to the end, a list of all, all the mutants in the file. Um, a bit of extra information like which tests code which mutant, which can sometimes be useful. And see, sometimes we get more than one mutation per line, it just appears like this. A bit further down into just um, general information, which mutations were active and which tests were done. So that's how we read the output. I'm going to jump back now to find it. And answer the question which um, hopefully people are asking themselves, which is, why didn't that take two hours? Well, the answer is lots of reasons. So firstly, it runs in parallel. Mm -hmm. A mutation testing is embarrassingly parallelizable. Um, generally speaking, um, unit tests tend to be um, CPU bound. So more CPUs equals more, te more tests we can run. And most machines these days have at least two cores. That's just my low spec laptop. Two cores equals two threads equals half the time. So we're down from two hours to round about one hour. Second reason, um, to answer your question from earlier, uh, Simon, is there are no compilation cycles. At no point did PyTest actually compile the code. Instead, it uses bytecode manipulation. Now, there are some downsides to this approach, but the fairly um, stunning upside is that we can create hundreds of thousands of mutants in sub-second time. It's got almost no cost. So from our, the hour we have, probably down to maybe half an hour, um, due to not having to compile the code. And the next reason is test prioritization. So I mentioned before, one of the first things that PyTest does is to record the execution time of each uh, test. So using that, it can use that information for other purposes apart from the infinite loop detection. And one purpose is to be able to run the um, cheap ones first. So you have one test that takes a second to run, another that takes a millisecond, PyTest will run the millisecond one first. And then importantly, it will stop as soon as one test fails. Now, even without um, ordering the tests, stopping when one fails will, on average, half the time um, of, of execution. So we're probably down to about sort of, 10, 15 minutes now, we might expect, from, our, um, from what we've seen. But I think, actually, by far, the, sort of the biggest reason why that doesn't take two hours is test selection. Now, this has had a relatively small impact on um, this particular code base. We're about 10 times faster because of this than we'd expect. On larger code bases, it can have hundreds or thousands of times um, sort of order of magnitude impact. So this is a bit which is really critical to making mutation testing scale. So only a subset of tests could kill each mutant. So all the other test runs we're doing are basically pure waste. So Selecting this test is important. Now, there's approaches that have been tried. Um, perhaps the most obvious and simplest is to do selection by naming convention. So you have a class called foo. We know it's going to be tested by test foo or foo test. So this is very simple, um, and it makes a huge difference compared to the entire suite. So we can target tests on a, sort of a class level. So we have to run all the tests in test foo against all the mutants in the foo class. And it's captured the program intent. Clearly, we intended to test um, foo with um, the test foo class. And also, it, so I say, it greatly reduces the number of tests we need to run. This is what um, an early tool called Jumble used to do. I think possibly Jester must have done this as well, but I've actually never checked. Um, and it was a, yes, should we say, a fairly easy to implement um, approach. But there's a few problems. It assumes this very rigid relationship between um, tests and classes. Now, probably sort of 80, maybe 90% of your tests probably are written that way, but there's a sizable minority which won't be written that way. It can make perfectly good sense to test a collaboration of classes as one unit, um, particularly, say, if many of those classes are non-public. And there's lots of other scenarios where you may not have this rigid relationship. So basically, you're placing a burden on the program. You're constraining how they should write the test in order to use this tool. And you're saying to them, if you don't write tests this way, this tool won't work properly. Or if you do use it, you'll be underestimating your suite effectiveness. So that was an improvement, but we can, we can do better. 
So the next approach you might consider is selection by static analysis. So the idea here is we create a core graph of all the production code um, and all the test code in a project. And then we see which tests can reach which methods in X hops. So say within 10 method calls, can this test reach that class? If so, we say it's tested by it. This is a big improvement. It gives it a ground out now of per method. So we now have to run all the tests on a per method basis. If there's a mutant in this method, we'll run these tests against them. It places no burden on the programmer. The program doesn't have to conform to any particular naming standards or do anything in particular. It just works by magic. And this is what some earlier versions of PyTest did. But there's a few problems. Uh, first problem is it's blind to late binding and flesh. So what I mean by that is if you refer to a class by an interface, the core graph can't see um, that it's a concrete class that you're actually interacting with. Similarly, reflection also doesn't appear on the core graph. So because of this, it will underestimate sweet effectiveness. Now perhaps more importantly, it turns out we can do a lot better than that anyway. So how PyTest now selects tests is using coverage data. So along with that timing data it collected at the start, it also collected coverage data on a per test basis. So PyTest knows which code each individual test executes. And it only runs um, tests against a mutant if they exercise the line of code that mutant was actually on. So we have a grand lounge now of per line. So what that means in practice is we have our class from earlier. We know that should not count inches below 10, executes only that line there. We know that should count inches above 10, executes just those two lines. And we know that should start with empty count doesn't execute any of the lines in the count method. So if we had our mutant here on line 5, um, we've changed a greater than equals to greater than yet again. We don't need to run two tests for that, that mutant. The test suite itself might have hundreds of thousands of tests. The, um, the test for a class might have hundreds of tests, but we only need to run two. And that mutant will survive because, as we saw before, uh, we don't actually have an effective test case. This mutant here on line six, we just commented out an increment, will run only one test um, for that mutant. Again, there could be hundreds of thousands of tests in the suite, there could be thousands of tests in the um, test for a class, but we only run a single test. And in this case, that mutant will be killed because we saw before we actually have an effective test for that. And perhaps most importantly, for this mutant here on line 11, I think we've changed a 0 to a 1, we'll run no test at all because we know that that line has no coverage. So we can instantly mark that mutant as survived. Now, this in particular makes a particularly huge difference. So we go back to our sort of very naive um, run the whole test suite approach. If we had a mutant that had no coverage, we'd be forced to run every single test um, in the suite in order to confirm that mutant was surviving. So it'd be the most expensive sort of mutant we could have. With a coverage-based approach, it becomes the cheapest. It has almost no processing cost at all. So using um, a sort of combination of um, techniques, we um, can analyze Joda time, which I think our rough uh, back of a pack packet estimate was about three days it would take to analyze that, um, just doing it by brute force. It takes about eight minutes on a fairly cheap dual core laptop. About three minutes if you've got a quad core. So, okay, that's still an annoying amount of time, but you can certainly run that multiple times a day without any problem. So, what about big code bases? So, Joe time, okay, it's 70,000 lines of code, so that's big ish, I suppose, but you know, some corporate code bases have millions of lines of code. So, how could we mutation test them? Well, actually, it turns out that size doesn't matter. So, one of the, I think the problems of a lot of the early research in muta into mutation testing. Um, less true these days, um, was it had this very sort of waterfall assumption about how it would be applied. You would write your code, and then at some time later, a separate QA team would come on and analyze it and see, is that code good? So you'd suddenly be dumped with a million lines of code and maybe 100,000 surviving mutants and have to understand what's going on. And it turns out that's just not a very sensible way to um, apply mutation testing. It doesn't really fit with how we tend to work these days. So the way to use mutation testing mutation testing isn't to do some sort of separate QA phase or separate mutation testing phase. 
is to make it a development activity, part of your sort of coding um, cycle. And to say, not an after the fact QA step. So if you mutation test locally as you develop, then you actually won't have much to mutation test. If it's small, you could mutate the whole project, as we've seen, 70,000 lines in three minutes. That might be acceptable. Uh, if it's bigger, or if three minutes is a long time to you, then just mutate a slice. And by far the most obvious slice to mutate is the code you've just changed. So if you have a million classes in your project, and you've just touched five of them, just need to analyze those five classes. So even on a million um, line code base, you can still be getting feedback in a number of seconds or a small number of minutes. That's not the only slice you can mutate. You could choose to just slice um, down to the bits of code you really cared about, but the most natural one is the code you've just changed. Actually, PyTest um, integrates with version control, so you can just do the single command. It's a little bit fiddly to set up. Once you set it up, it's just a one command, and it will check what you've changed locally and only analyze the, those changes. So even though you're mutating um, locally on um, a laptop as you're coding, it still makes sense probably to uh, mutate on the CI server. You have more time there. So if you're forced to mutate just a slice on your laptop, perhaps you don't mind waiting an hour once a night to get the whole project analyzed on the CI server. Or it might be too big. Maybe that would take days to uh, mutate. But it turns out that you don't actually have to mutate everything if you just want to get a feel for, for the trends. So there's been some recent research that suggests that a sample of just a 1,000 mutants is enough to give you a reasonably accurate gauge of the overall mutation score. That's basically how many mutants um, survive versus are killed for projects of really any size. Um, so this is an actual, it doesn't tell you where the gaps are. Um, it just tells you that my project as a whole has got um, falling test strength. Make sure you have a look at that. So let's have a quick look now about um, what we found in Google Truth. So just to recap, Google Truth is a product from Google. It's in sort of the testing arena. It looks to be, on the whole, pretty well tested. Um, and it's not been mutation tested. It's been developed. So it's just been relying, presumably, on normal code coverage. Um, so when we ran it, I had a quick look through, and I found um, some classic test errors. So this is primitive int of a subject, but I failed to note uh, what line this was on. But see, this is, whoops, I've just... See, this is the um, it's not equal method. And this mutant here um, is surviving. So all we've done is comment out this method fails with raw message. Uh, what this method does, this method is the method that actually throws assertions for this assertion library. Um, so probably quite an important um, thing for the, the code to be doing. Now, if you look at the um, tests, we'll see it had line coverage. We knew it was code about at least one test. And this looks to be the test which it was meant to be testing that functionality, testing that behavior. And there's a problem with it. So I'm going to pick on you again, Simon. Um, can you see the problem with that test? Okay, so you're really testing me now. Let's see. Uh... <clears throat> I can't at the moment. That is okay because it took me a much to spot it as well. But there's a problem there because the mutation testing is telling us it's a problem. So quite a sort of common thing you encounter when people start doing this is they kind of doubt it's true. But the problem here is it's actually quite a classic error once you've seen it. Um, is this if the assert um, sorry if the method doesn't throw a assertion it continues and the test passes. It only actually asserts on the uh, message if an assertion was thrown. So classically, you'd have a, a little fail here to throw an assertion error. Because this is a library which is throwing assertion errors, it can't do that. So elsewhere in the code base, uh, the programmers have put in a line this just to throw a new error, say, we expect it to throw. And it turns out in various locations, they've forgotten to do that. So they have tests which don't test the, sort of the core functionality of um, 
the truth, which is just through assertions. And we also found uh, a couple of equivalent mutations. Now, there's a lot of code here. Um, does that sort of, everyone sort of read that okay? Does that need to be a bit bigger? Yeah, maybe a touch bigger. And to press control plus and see what happens. Absolutely nothing. No, you've got the, you have the size you've got. No worries. Uh, if, if, yeah, people, if people can't see it correctly, if you click the cog on the bottom right and uh, increase your quality, that'll probably uh, go halfway to making it better. Yeah. But this is the um, it's not equal to method of primitive double array subject. And we have put a very similar mutation, mutation into this file, which, again, we commented out the line which throws the, um, the assertion. Now, this also failed to make a test fail. Um, but in this case, the test actually looked fine. They had the, um, the throw error exception exception in them. So the tests actually look good. So the question is, why doesn't this, um, why doesn't this cause a test to fail? And the reason is that this is actually part of a performance optimization. Uh, what's going on here is this line is what the method is trying to achieve is it's asking um, are these two arrays equal? I don't think they should be. Um, so if they are equal, um, so if they are the same object, um, it fails straight away as a shortcut. So it's and it, if they are the same object, it goes further down here to do um, a deep comparison. So if it's the same object, you get um, the same failure as you get if it was two different objects. Um, that's happened to have the same content. So this is there for performance. And performance isn't unit testable. So I guess the most common uh, type of equipment meter I, I've seen is a performance optimization. So this would seem to be a problem. We have a equipment mutant. It's not, yeah, it's not highlighted in any redundant code. The code arguably makes sense. Normally you might say, well, is this a mature optimization? I say in this case, probably not. Um, this is a library for use with an open-ended code, so potentially it could be passed in humongous double arrays by somebody at some point. So it's perfectly feasible to have this optimization there to avoid this processing. Um, in other cases, that might be a, a discussion what to have um, if you get an equivalent mutant, which is to performance. But I still think the equivalent mutant is actually telling us something quite useful. Um, the first question I asked when I saw this was, well, this is great, um, but actually, if I've passed in the self-same object to an uh, assertion, say I expect them not to be equal, it'd be quite nice to have that bit of extra information um, passed back to me. So instead of failing with the same error message, I think the behavior should probably be different and say, actually, in fact, you've passed in the same object. If I was trying to debug something and understand why test was failing, that would be useful information. So I'd argue that in this case, the equivalent mutation has actually highlighted a better behavior that the code could have. Now, perhaps the people in charge of Google Truth don't agree. Perhaps you don't agree. Perhaps we think the behavior is just perfect the way it is. Well, I still think the equivalent mutation has actually told us something useful. So this is the method again. I'd say this is sort of quite a, a flabby method. Um, my sort of objection to this code really is it's doing two things. It's got two responsibilities. So one responsibility is comparing the quality of double arrays. The other responsibility is throwing assertions when um, arrays are not equal. So this is entirely subjective, but I would say the code would be much cleaner if we separated those two concerns out. So that instead of having um, one method doing all those things, we push out the quality check to a different method and then leave the, um, the failing um, from the assertion in the visual method. So there's various ways you could do that. I've just did a quick stab here and actually ended up putting it out into two methods. And interestingly, if you do this um, to the code, you'll find that you have no remaining um, equivalent mutants. So the equivalent mutant has basically nudged us to try and clean up our code, and it's hard to something we could improve. Now, so it's not quite that straightforward because uh, my version of the code still has uh, this line here which is a performance optimization, still checking for direct equality of the two arrays. Now, as it happens, with the default set of um, mutation operators, that doesn't create a mutant there. If you enable PyTest's um, stronger set of mutation operators, you'll again get a mutant. You'll basically just remove this um, if statement entirely, and that will be a surviving mutant. So we seem to be sort of back to where we started, except um, this 
comparing double arrays for equality concern is repeated in more than one place um, within this class. So if we were to refactor the code further so that we reuse this method um, instead of duplicating that logic in more than one place, then we'll go from um, more than one surviving mutant down to a single surviving mutant. So even though we can't make it go away altogether by making the code cleaner, we still reduce the number. So the, the equivalent mutation is still giving us useful information. Now, in many code bases, you actually won't encounter any equivalent mutants. Um, I know that you know, Sky and Livingston have projects where they break the build on anything less than 100% mutation score. So that basically implies that they mustn't be encountering any equivalent mutants. So it seems to depend very much on the domain you're working in. Some domains are much more likely to require, for example, performance optimizations, or there's probably other factors that come into play. So the domain you're working would sort of dictate to a degree um, how many equivalent mutants you find. Uh, but also, I think the code style, and we've just seen an example there, different styles are more likely to create equivalent mutants. And a sort of interesting, sort of very subtle effect I've found is that when you mutation test the code base, it pushes you towards, I guess, a slightly more functional style. Um, and so code which I personally consider to be cleaner. So my own experience is for the domains I work in, um, equivalent mutants are very rare. But the only place I tend to see them are in auto-generated um, equals methods. So I think that's actually me nearly done. Um, so sort of, I guess my sort of take-home points are that if you mutation test as you develop, rather than at some sort of separate um, after fact query phase, then it's now fast enough to be entirely practical. Um, you can get feedback from mutation testing in seconds or, or minutes. And that although equivalent mutations um, have been considered to be a problem with mutation testing for you know, quite some time, in actual fact, OK, they are a problem to a degree, but they're also helpful. Um, they also give you useful feedback about your code, which you might not otherwise have. And I think that is me uh, entirely done. OK, awesome. So um, a couple of questions uh, from RC. And if anyone does have questions, uh, please do add them into, into the RC chat. And uh, I'll ask them straight to Henry. So let me find the first one. Uh, we have one from LinkD or Linked. Um, does Henry eat his own dog food, i.e., do you mutation test the pie tests? tests? <laughs> and are there any cool lessons that you've learned from that? Uh, the answer is I would like to uh, mutation test pie test. There's some rather unpleasant implementation details that makes that quite hard um, to do with. Many times when developing it, I've accidentally mutated the PyTest code and spent an entire evening trying to debug it, wondering exactly why the impossible was happening before I realized actually, yes, the thing that was running against it was, in fact, mutating itself. So in order to do that, I simply have to create a, a clone of PyTest in a different um, package and run it against it that way. I have done that once or twice. Um, I can report that the code does not have amazing tests. They're not atrocious, but they're not amazing. Um, but I haven't actually got that into state where I can do that as a continual thing um, to drive the code forward. Um, other code bases I work with, I'm mutation test um, from the get-go. Okay, cool. Actually, uh, would you mind uh, unsharing your screen actually while we do the questions? Sure. Just, uh, hold on. That's cool. That perfect. That's yeah. perfect. Um, okay, so uh, next question um, from Mr. Deviant. Uh, how does the effectiveness of mutation testing compare to property-based testing? Uh, I've been asked this before, um, and they're basically completely different things. Um, so mutation testing is testing your tests. Property-based testing is testing your code, just in a different style. It's actually quite a good question, um, because just yesterday as it happened, um, we open-sourced a property-based testing library for Java 8, which um, I should... I'll paste this into the, um, the chat to share the link. Um, so this was this red raw hot off the press. Um, it's a graduate project um, here for my training scheme, um, which has been really good fun working on, actually. Um, so yes, the answer is isn't really any relationship, although people have suggested, for example, using mutation testing to, um, as a way of assessing when property-based testing should stop generating tests. I don't think anyone's actually done that yet, um, or just generally for assessing how effective the technique is. Okay, so I'll, I'm putting that link into uh, into into RC as well. Um, so it's question we look at, sorry, sorry, go for it. So we actually love to get any feedback people have on um, it's called quick theories. 
um, just to be a, I think it might be quite useful. We haven't really used it in practice yet, so any feedback will be critically received on that. Okay, awesome. Uh, another question from Nord80. Um, what's a good book for mutation testing? Do you, have, do you, have you written a book on this uh, topic? I haven't written a book on this topic. I do believe that um, Philip is currently writing one. I don't think it's complete yet, but it's one on Lean Public book. Um, I've not read it yet. I can't really come onto its contents, but it's probably the only book on mutation testing. So therefore, it's not certainly the best. Mm -hmm. um, and you also mentioned uh, you mentioned Java 8. Um, do you have um, are there certain versions of Java you don't support or implementations that are not supported? So, too recently we supported um, let's say Java 5 um, upwards. Uh, last release dropped Java 5 support finally, so it's now got a minimum of um, Java 6. I'm actually quite keen to support these sort of archaic versions because it's really useful for working with legacy code. That's when I first created it was for a large legacy project, and so I want to support people stuck in that sort of unpleasant space uh, as much as possible. Uh, so it should work, be on any JVM, but the only, um, only constraint is I think Xtreme to use internally, and it has to support the, the enhanced mode, which I think basically all, all the common ones do. Okay, and in terms of uh, in terms of vendors, uh, do you support J9 and OpenJDK, Oracle? Yeah, Open, OpenJDK, Oracle, all fine. We haven't. The only ones actually it's tested against are um, OpenJDK and Oracle. I believe it is working on. We have a test in place for a historic version of IBM's JDK because someone had a problem. I can't remember which version that was now, but it certainly works on that version and presumably later versions if they exist. I guess it really just depends on your on the integration with the bytecode manipulation tool. Which which do you use out of interest? Uh, ASM. ASM. Cool. Okay. Uh, let me check if there's any further questions. Uh, we don't have any questions at the minute. Um, so I'll say a massive thank you to um, to Henry Cole. So that's a really interesting uh, session actually. I, mean, I used to be a tester actually um, as, a, as a functional tester. That's how I started my career 15 odd years ago. So um, I. I I really enjoyed that. I think that was a really good session, nice hands-on session, and, and, and very practical. Um, so, for people who want to who want to learn more about PyTest, what's the uh, what's the site? Is it PyTest.org? That's right. Yes, PyTest.org. PyTest.org. Awesome. So, let me uh, let me just quickly before we finish, let me just quickly share my screen because I wanted to show you the next session. So, yeah, this was uh, mutation testing with PyTest, uh, and please do follow Henry on Twitter. Um, at 0HJC. Our uh, next session on the virtual jug is Programming Language Development Made Easy. Uh, and we have, uh, this is basically around a tool called Xtext, um, which allows you to create languages such as Extend. And uh, we have two speakers for this one Sven Eftinge and Miro Sponerman. I really hope I pronounced them correctly. I, uh, I, I do struggle with my pronunciations, unfortunately, but uh, there we go. Um, so yeah, a massive uh, thank you to Henry for, for joining us for the first uh, for your first video session. Um, and uh, and yeah, how, how did you enjoy it? Yeah, it was slightly strange uh, with all from green earphones on, but uh, <laughs> that was good. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, and uh, see everyone on the next virtual jug session. Cheers, everyone. Bye.